Hello, my name is Dana Reidenauer. I use they and she pronouns. I live in the ancestral lands of the Conestoga Susquehannock people, known today as Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I am your publishing BFF, a line and copy editor and book coach specializing in inclusive romance, cozy mysteries, and children's books. Although I typically focus on words in my editing business, today I'll be talking with you about something a little bit different, numbers. I've shared a PDF of my slides and notes, including multiple pages of links to my sources with the conference organizers. Feel free to follow along. So without further ado, let's dig in. Publishing for love or money. Paranormal author Amanda Hawking is hashtag goals. While working at a group home, Amanda spent her spare time furiously writing and submitting to publishers. In 2010, out of sheer desperation for $300 to travel to an exhibition about Muppets creator Jim Henson, she self-published to Amazon and Smashwords in what we now call Going Wide. In June, her sales exploded, and by July, she'd made $6,000 in profit. She earned about $9,000 in sales in August alone, so she quit her day job. The following year, she sold her one millionth Kindle book, joining an exclusive club of million-selling authors that at that time included James Patterson, Sieg Larson, and Nora Roberts. And by the start of 2012, Amanda had earned more than $2 million and caught the attention of the traditional publishing industry. She signed a multi-million dollar deal with St. Martin's Press, but not before revolutionizing independent publishing. Amanda Hawking's Cinderella story is every author's dream. Just one great book and you'll strike it rich. But Amanda is an outlier. For every Amanda Hawking, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of authors who may never sell a book, let alone earn enough to become full-time authors. Here's a reality check. Books not selling in the saturated market is typical. Most books don't sell. Becca Syme, fall 2023. And until you can live off your backlist, don't quit your day job. But before we examine publishing's financial picture, let's look at its history. Let's find out how we got here. For most of human history, the written word was the property of rulers and the religious. Uh, making paper, papyrus, parchment, what have you, was laborious. And then ink and quills had to be made as well. After that, every letter was written by hand. It's no wonder only wealthy people owned reading material. In 1040 of the Common Era, movable type was invented in China, and 400 years later, Johannes Gutenberg introduced the mechanical printing press in Europe. This led to the formation of publishing houses, including Cambridge University Press, which was founded in 1534 during the reign of King Henry VIII, and still operates today as one of the oldest known publishing houses in the West. In 1811, Jane Austen used a vanity publisher. She paid the publishing house for the work to print Sense and Sensibility. The invention of the computer and the advent of desktop publishing made the creation of books and other publications inordinately easier. One could say the book technology revolution really began in the 1990s with the introduction of ebooks for PDAs, personal digital assistants like Blackberry and Palm Pilot, print on demand, which bypassed the need to do set print runs, emerged in 1997 with the founding of Lightning Source. By the turn of the century, weblogs had become popular, leading to the blog to book phenomenon. Julie and Julia is one such book. Home cooks also published cookbooks made from their blog posts. 
Then Stephen King kicked off the 21st century by selling PDF installments of The Plant from his website with a statement, my friends, we have a chance to become big publishing's worst nightmare. Big publishing wasn't too worried, however. Credit cards and the ability to easily pay for online purchases hadn't evolved enough. So publishers expected readers to keep purchasing books in person at bookstores. Besides, they said, who is going to vet the quality of independently published books? Staff at Wharton School, one of the leading institutions dedicated to the study of business, dismissed the possible impact of indie books in their column, Knowledge at Wharton, in August 2000. Publishing is obviously coming to the internet, but the question is what the paradigm will be. While experts say the plant is a test, they doubt it is the harbinger of an earth-shattering shift in the way people will sell and buy books. Who really would read one of the 100,000 unpublished books that authors might self-publish on the web each year? And there are some sites devoted to self-publishing, but I'm not sure they will ever evolve into something that has credibility. The joke's on them. The electronics companies and internet-based bookstores took a different view and banked on the pos popularity of eBooks. Sony released an e-reader somewhere around 2005 and Amazon changed the course of publishing forever with the launch of the Kindle and Kindle Direct Publishing in 2007. By 2012, self-published titles had reached 235,000, up nearly 300% from just six years earlier. In 2024, more than 1 million English titles are available on Kindle, and countless others are available on other platforms and in additional languages. Let's zoom in on the last decade, what is considered the golden age of publishing. E-readers increased readers' access to books. All they needed was an internet connection, and for those who didn't have internet, some libraries allowed patrons to borrow e-readers preloaded with books. In an interview on All Things Considered in February 2013, incoming CEO of traditional publisher Hachette Book Group said, I think we're in a golden age for books, reading, writing, and publishing. And the ways that publishers can work to create readers to connect readers with writers now are the kinds of things that publishers have dreamt of doing since Gutenberg first put down a line of type. Amanda Hawking was part of the revolution that moved publishing away from publishing houses and into the hands of individual authors. Regularly releasing quality books went a long way to cementing indie authors' legitimacy in the book marketplace. And as increasing numbers of writers realized how easy it was to self-publish, more and more titles were brought online. Readers loved this as suddenly there was a glut of books to read. By 2018, however, the golden age was subsiding, even as prospectors continued the gold rush. The market became saturated and by 2021, the saturation point had passed. USA Today bestselling author, coach, and creator of the Better Faster Academy, Becca Syme, has noted that for every one book for on a TBR, on a to-be-read list, 280 additional titles waited in the wings. Practically speaking, what does oversaturation look like? Maria Sequoy of All Right Well analyzes romance and sends out a report each month. This is January 2024's report. So if you wrote firefighter romance novels, your book would have to sell about 10 copies a day for you to be top ranked in its subcategory. Those sales would earn you about $150 a month. Compare that with sports romance, an especially popular category top ranked books were selling about 3,800 copies every day and earning $30,000 a month. 
Now, keep in mind that 80% of sales money goes to books that appear on the first page of Amazon search results. And the better your book does, the more Amazon promotes it. So depending on your category, you have a steep climb to get onto that first page. But before the floodgates opened, the big five had kept the market unsaturated. Becca explained in a presentation last year that by limiting how many titles they released, publishing houses like Simon & Schuster, Penguin Random House, HarperCollins, Hachette Book Group, and Macmillan kept readers hungry for more books. This meant less competition for attention and for buyer's money. Self-publishing took advantage of those conditions. There was a time when you could throw anything up on Amazon and it would sell. But that was about 10 years ago, Ali Machete of The Writer's Ally said in January. And so that brings us to today, to the post-gold rush. Most of the authors who are hitting it big have either the backing of trad publishing houses or they're indie authors who've been in the business for a while. The vast majority of authors earning more than $100,000 have already published at least 15 books and 40 is a more common response. These authors are likely to tell you they've been writing professionally for more than five years and publishing their books for more than three years. And Maria Sequoy of All Right Well said last year, simply put, what worked to start their business won't work to start ours because the context of the industry has changed. What works for them now won't work for us because they already have an audience and a backlist. So still with me? Still determined to publish your novel, your poetry, your nonfiction book? then keep with me as I talk about your options. With self-publishing, you're in charge of your destiny. If you're someone who likes making decisions, self-publishing is for you. If you're confident in your writing ability, but not in your ability to judge character or editing prowess, then look into traditional publishing or hire an agency to assist you. Or if you're publishing solely for love and not for money, upload your stories to fan fiction sites or other free reading apps. Industry expert Jane Friedman annually releases a summary of key book publishing paths. So visit her website, janefriedman.com, to check out the six options currently available. So let's look first at traditional publishing and what's involved with that path. Last year, literary agent Lynette Novak gave an interview to Eastern Pen Points, a publication of the Eastern Pennsylvania chapter of the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, SCBWI, in which she said, a common misconception of traditional publishing is that their book will sell fast, that they'll become rich off the first book. I mean, that can happen, but that's certainly not the norm. And that their book will be on shelves months after signing the contract. Publishing is a hurry up and wait industry. Traditional publishing has a significant cost of time up front. And then there's the impact of inflation. Authors with a big five house have seen their earnings decline as inflation has risen over the past five years. And Rebecca Giblin and Cory Doctorow wrote in Choke Point Capitalism, advances have been cut by more than half since the great financial crisis of 2007 and eight. The benefit of traditional publishing is that the publishing house takes on all the financial risk and you get money up front. But you also have to spend time querying and then work through the editorial process once your contract is signed. The value of a contract varies significantly and is based on many factors. Advances are usually paid out in thirds or fourths, about, each, uh, about a year apart. And many books don't earn out 
So what you get from your contract minus your agent's fees and taxes is the maximum you will earn. So a trade-off for having everything done for you, in addition to the investment of time, is most of the marketing responsibilities will fall on your shoulders. Publishing houses have been cutting costs and moving away from organizing everything for their authors. Your publisher also controls the prices and your books typically aren't enrolled in Kindle Unlimited, which means you aren't in front of those voracious readers. And if you haven't reached this conclusion yet, trad authors likely work multiple jobs or live in two income households to support themselves. The Authors Guild in its 2023 author income survey of about 5,500 authors looked at who was earning money and how much in traditional publishing. Men and women are represented at almost an even split, but men earn 41% more than women. The median incomes of trans men and women were $15,000 and $340, respectively. But not listed had the highest median, $32,000. So take that for what you will. Unfortunately, the Black authors are still feeling the effects of systemic marginalization. In 2022, full-time Black authors earn a median of only $2,400 from their books as compared to a median of almost $11,000 for white authors. The disparity is also grim, but not as bad when looking at full-time authors' total author-related earnings, with Black authors earning a median of $15,250 and white authors earning $20,000. When comparing all full-time and part-time authors combined, Black authors' 2022 median book-related income dropped to $800 versus white authors at $2,000. White authors were a third more likely to be traditionally published than Black authors, and on average, they spent nearly two and a half times more on their book marketing than Black authors. So remember what I said about uh, the... Wharton School in the in 2000 and how they poo-pooed uh, indie publishing? Well, you might think that indie authors wouldn't be making an impact, but many are making bank. Full-time self-published authors earn at least 67% more than trad authors through book sales alone. Typically, if a self-published author can hit the five-year mark in the business, they're likely to out-earn their traditionally published counterparts. And the genres also make a difference. Though overall author incomes are still low, experienced self-published authors have nearly doubled their earnings since 2018 with the help of effective marketing efforts. Authors of romance and romantic suspense are still out-earning other genres with graphic novelists coming in a close second. In addition to book sales, author-related activities bring in a significant portion of the, those incomes. And that's from the uh, key takeaways from the Author Guild's 2023 Author Income Survey. So let's take a snapshot of um, indie author publishing. This is the big indie author data drop of 2023, was commissioned by the Alliance of Independent Authors ally, of which I am a partner member, but I'm using their sources because it's just a great source. Um, they commissioned this survey last year, and they reached out to their partner businesses for data, and this report re provides valuable insights into self-publishing. So author diversity. In a reverse of trad publishing, in the publishing, cisgender women earn 40% more than cis men. And LGBTQIA plus authors earn almost 20% more than straight authors. And the education 
of authors is also strikes me as interesting. The median income of authors whose highest education is secondary school, so high school, was 21,825 in 2022. Compare that to undergrads and postgrads of $17,000 and $10,000 respectively. Examined by ethnicity, Asian and biracial slash multiracial authors earn more than white authors. Black authors are still underpaid. In disability, the category, disabled authors earn a third percent of the typical earnings of non-disabled authors. However, neurodivergent and cognitively impaired authors earn more than the typical disabled author. And one reason for that may be that self-publishing and re work, remote work are generally less stressful and more accommodating for chronic illness and other disabilities. We now turn our, our attention to the nuts and bolts or dollars and cents of self-publishing. In contrast to trad publishing, all the financial risk is borne by the self-publishing author. This past December, romance author Elena Lyons shared her balance sheet. She'd had nearly $1,700 of income, but her outgoing expenses were about $7,500 a net profit of negative 5,800. So let's break down her $7,500 in costs. To create a quality book, you need to invest in quality products and services, ensuring you're paying your providers a living wage. Elena's operating expenses likely included many of the following costs. Her cover could have cost anywhere between $100 and $500, and some covers even cost over $1,000. Editing would, might have included a developmental read, which usually runs in the multiple thousands. Beta reading, uh, while you can find free readers, uh, beta reading uh, as a paid service is becoming increasingly popular. That could cost around $500. Line and copy edits could cost $1,000 respectively. And proofreading, that service provided after the book is formatted, whether that's an ebook or a print book, would cost around $800. That formatting, which I just mentioned, can run around $100 for an ebook and uh, 10 times that for a book that will be printed in paperback or hardcover. Then uh, she might have purchased ISBN codes, which help your book uh, be registered in uh, the different uh, bookstores. The, some countries provide them free of charge, but in the US, we purchase them for 10 for $295 or one for $125. Then there's a cost to file in the US for copyright. That's between $45 and $65. And then advertising uh, on, on Facebook and Amazon and other sites, that could run five to $10,000 a day. So uh, here's a publishing snapshot, uh, a really nice graphic from mystery author Jane Elsie to show everything that went into her book. Publishing involves three major resources, time, talent, and money, and Jane illustrated them here. She spent 2,600 hours researching, writing, and editing Killer Croquet on the Emerald Isle. She then paid for multiple editors and a cover designer. When she calculated her royalties, her break-even figure was 500 sales of electronic and print books. So in other words, to recoup all of her costs, she had to sell 500 ebooks or print books. But self-publishing is more than just writing. It's a business and authors need to think clearly and carefully about where they'll spend their time and energy. It's not as simple as writing a book, uploading it to Amazon or another vendor and waiting for the money to roll in. 
Writing a good book and honing your craft is at most 40 to 50% of chasing career longevity when you factor in all of the business stuff, author Noah Steele said in December. And as dismal as the publishing outlook is with its oversaturation and high startup costs, Becca Syme asserted in a webinar last fall, if you want to publish, you can. The industry never closes, but you must be willing to play the long game. So are you publishing for love or for money? Well, if you're determined to self-publish as a business, here's some advice from Ali Machete. You might be able to DIY it for cheap, but you're costing yourself the results you want. Making money requires investing money. Make sure you create the very best marketable product you can. Your time is valuable, so hiring a pro may be more cost effective than trying to do it yourself, and the results might look better. Free or low cost books must be part of your strategy. So when uh, Jane Elsey looked at that $500 to break even, if she takes into account the free or low cost books uh, to use as um, reader magnets, she might need to actually increase that number from 500 to more. Uh, building your author newsletter is extremely important, so you'll want to invest time and attention in that action. And consider subscriptions like Patreon, Substack, and Ream as ways to both publish, get your stories out there, and build a community of readers. You'll achieve your goals if you keep pushing ahead. If we look at Cinderella's work ethic here, uh, from our Cinderella story with Amanda Hawking, here are some of the key takeaways. Readers will buy more from an author they like if more is available. And it usually takes three to four books before an indie author will see an exponential growth in their sales. So if you publish one book and it falls flat, as it often does, Write the next book and get that out. Write the next book. Write the next book. Keep publishing and you'll build momentum. And so let's look at Amanda Hawking, the paranormal author who struck publishing gold in 2010. She's still publishing. As of February 4 this year, she had released 39 books and announced the impending publication of five more. Her secret? Treating writing like a job, not a hobby. She cited Mark Hoppus of Blink-182 as saying passion isn't enough. You must have a work ethic. That's been the most life-changing advice that I got because I had a passion for writing. And I know a lot of other people do too, but it's not enough to just want something. You have to be able to work for it too and put in the hours and the time. In the FAQs on her website, Amanda shared her advice for aspiring writers. Write a lot and read more than you write. Learn to take criticism, edit a lot, and find a good editor. So should you need a good editor, please contact me either by sending an email to hello at yourpublishingbff.com, completing the contact form at www.yourpublishingbff.com or DMing me on Instagram where you can follow, you guessed it, Your Publishing BFF. If my services don't align with your needs, I'm happy to refer you to editors I trust in my extensive network. Now, as a conference special, I invite you to schedule a free one-on-one -on -one conversation with me. Call them coaching sessions, information sessions, or friendly chats. One-on-ones are your opportunities to pick my brain about writing, editing, and publishing. My background is in journalism, so I can talk specifically about publicity, too. I'm also versed in romance, cozy mystery, and children's books, with a special interest in inclusive stories and representation of diverse bodies and disabilities. I hope to hear from you soon. Thank you.